Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll talk about the new proposal, one of many that was published by the EU Commission. And this one is about IVDR, a shortage of medical device and IVDR and the UDAMED uh, transition also. And I have with me Eric Volbrecht from Axon Lawyer. So Eric, welcome to, to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hello, everyone. That's me again. Exactly. So our preferred lawyer is here to help us understand um, this new proposal. What is written inside? Will who should use that? Uh, will it help? How when it will be applicable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, mm-hmm. uh, Eric, um, can we first make a summary of this proposal? Because yeah, it's uh, as I said, yeah. one out of many that we are published now. So, what is new sure. with this one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can certainly say that uh, we've had our share of, uh, let's say, uh, proposals that uh, change stuff on the uh, on the MDR and also on the RVDR, by the way. Exactly. So uh, this proposal, uh, yeah, we are still sort of still figuring out how the extension of the MDR works uh, that uh, uh, has been done last year, 20 March. Exactly. And also one of the sneaky things is that people tend to think like, oh, this, this, they are, they're always amending the, the MDR, but every one of these proposals also includes a little tweak to the IVDR. Exactly. Because you will remember that the extension proposal removed the sell-off period for the IVDs, for example, right? Yeah. And now this proposal, same thing. So this proposal, it was made on 24 January, which is... Not that long ago. Uh, and this proposal does uh, three things. So uh, first of all, uh, what it does is it introduces uh, an, uh, an obligation for manufacturers to inform uh, basically everyone of uh, an interruption in the supply of uh, and then the title of the article says certain devices, but these are devices for which it, re- it is reasonably foreseeable that the interruption may result in serious harm or a risk of serious harm to patients or public health in one or more member states. Okay, so That's... do we have do we have, do they propose a list of what is this device? No, <laughs> that would be too easy. It's no sport. <laughs> Okay. I, I will go into more detail later on that, but this, this would be, of course, a very sensible thing to do. Exactly. But uh, uh, this is not envisaged yet uh, for medical devices. Then the proposal does a, a second thing, and that is uh, it's going to phase in Udemet earlier. Yeah. yeah Which is good on, because... on the sentence, yeah, it's written uh, to uh, have the modules... Uh, used mandatory uh, earlier uh, because on the UMDI it says mainly you, you will use UDAMED until all the modules are available and everything is fine and now yeah. they want to break this and say no 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 let's use each module when they will be ready yes that is indeed that is indeed how it works because the uh, because the MDR and the IVDR uh, had plans to phase in UDAMED uh, all in a so called big bang approach so yeah everything in one go when uh, apparently the commission was still optimistically thinking that Udemed would be ready uh, quite soon. Yeah. And then what we've seen is that Udemed got delayed, it got delayed, it got delayed a bit more, and then it got delayed a bit more. And then last year, there was this update in the planning that said, maybe 2029. And then exactly. I think everybody was like, what the beep? Okay, I think this is where basically uh, the boiling point was reached, and it was decided that was that it was politically not feasible anymore to delay Udamed uh, uh, as long as they were planning to do, just because I think it was the uh, the clinical investment module or the vigilance module, I don't remember. One of these two was severely delayed. And then the market surveillance module, which is basically, we could say, the 
sneaky, sneaky uh, AI enabled back office for the member states in which they basically can see trends and can see who has been naughty and who has been nice and things like that, or basically the real data mining uh, happens. This, uh, they hadn't even started with that. So of course that was going to be a problem. And the problem they also needed to fix was that uh, member states, uh, of course they have an interest to know which devices are being distributed and who does this and traceability and so on. So member states were already plenty annoyed with the commission uh, because the because Udemet was taking forever. Exactly. There was this, this EBSCO meeting in December 2019, which I put posted a video of on my blog where you could basically the, see the commission inform the member states saying, ha, 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 it will take a lot longer. And then you saw all these people go like, what the shit, taking so long. And then all these member state delegates being really angry and also some actually saying like, why don't you just face in you met one module at a time? I think it was the Dutch government uh, saying that. And now finally, almost five years after that date, the commission has decided, oh, that's maybe not such a bad idea. Let's face in you met uh, gradually. So this is what they're going to do. In the meantime, of course, uh, we've had a proliferation of member states doing weird stuff to still meet their information needs, yeah. which ranged from, I think, Finland doing the most practical, but also most crazy solution uh, which you would expect from the Finns, of course, creative, but uh, guerrilla people. They just said, you know what? Even though Unimet is voluntary, in Finland it's mandatory. Good luck. Exactly. And, 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 to, and, the, and uh, this is this is something that is important uh, just to remember to people for, for, for the European Union. Actually, Udamed is in place because we are we have no tool. I mean, any nobody has a, a clear tool to say that this product is approved or not to be on the EU uh, market. We have no that database right. like uh, the yeah. US database. We have nothing like that. So at the end, when we want yeah. to find out if a product is on the market in Europe, or you can ask a CE certificate from a manufacturer and then they show to you, yes, I have the authorization. Or if it's a class one device, they will give you a declaration of conformity, which gives no information at all. So at the end, we are a bit lost to say that. So this was the objective. So yeah, waiting until 2029, 2030 for, Having finally a database that will be showing to us exactly what is approved was making no sense at all. No, no, definitely not. Now, and I think it's good that you uh, make this uh, little sidebar because this is this. It, it is also important uh, to note this because if you look at the way the NDR and the IVDR are written. They are really drafted in a way that they are they literally run on information that is in Udemet, goes through Udemet, is uploaded to Udemet. And if Udemet isn't there, yeah, then uh, you are kind of handicapped in a way. And yeah. this is for, for the clinical module, I remember that they created a specific guidance to how to now report clinical information when you damage is not Udamed available. Is not so ready. Exactly. It, was, uh, yeah. it was crazy to say, oh, I, I need you. I yeah, asked you to then... use Udamed, but in case <laughs> damage is not ready, here is an MDCG guidance, how you should make that. Exactly. So that all these kind of little workarounds, what you also see is you had competent authorities that basically had no patients uh, and they just said, you know, we make our own database like yeah. uh, happened in Ireland. So you need to do double reporting, which is also annoying because there was the question like, yeah, what would be, uh, because Udemet was available already some modules on a voluntary basis. So what happens with the information that was already put in there on a voluntary basis? Do we need to re-input that when it becomes effective, I think there the, the, the commission said, no, no, that's not what we're going to do. What's in there is in there. But it's just, yeah, I mean, it it will hopefully, uh, yeah, uh, put an end to this information chaos that we currently have with uh, Udemet. Uh, exactly. Just because they took the policy decision, Udemet isn't mandatory until all of Udemet is ready. Uh, which I think was maybe not the best of solutions. Um, and 
then there is the uh, then there is the last part which is the uh, which is uh, for, the, uh, for the transition IVDR is that they are extending uh, the uh, IVDR uh, but also for the IVDR they introduce the uh, uh, obligation to supply information about interruption of supply. So it's not only for the MDR, it's also for the IVDR. Exactly. So in terms yeah. of uh, all, all this proposal now, so we have this that is published. It's still a proposal. We have no, uh, it's not in place now. So let's say it may be <laughs> uh, that way. So uh, manufacturers, since... You, you, MDR and IVDR was kind of uh, announced, uh, heard about the deadlines that were mm -hmm. fixed and not changing. And then they saw proposal number one with the COVID, proposal number two with the change, proposal number three. Last year, a March proposal for MDR, et cetera. Now this proposal for IVDR change also, et cetera. So at the end, do manufacturers care anymore about what's happening here? Or it's like just... Okay, we, we, a new proposal, but it doesn't matter for me at all. Well, um, yeah, it's a bit like, uh, yeah, should they care? Uh, and and also what you see is that this these changes upon changes upon changes, they do make it confusing for some manufacturers that, that if they do not invest enough resources into, let's say, keeping on top of things, but what you do see is where, uh, let's say, remediation for the NDR or the IVDR is a big project that requires serious resources, both in time, money, and FTEs. This is where you see that middle, senior, top management is deciding like, okay, so what do we see? We have these nerds in regulatory cry wolf all the time, eh? like, uh, oh, deadline coming up. Oh, no, uh, it's a regulatory cliff. If we don't meet this deadline, then uh, the world will end for the European market. And then you see uh, deadlines being moved, which is really not a good signal to the market because mainly it means that uh, uh, on the one hand, we don't give a shit about having a functioning regulatory system, but on the other hand, we are completely interested in prolonging the current situation of chaos because that's the best we can do to manage the chaos, right? Exactly. So this is this is a weird signal, and what it leads to is we've seen, for example, in uh, both medical devices and IVDs. For IVDs, for example, the class D. Uh, uh, grace period uh, would end uh, next year, yeah. uh, 26 May, right? 26 May, 2025. So everybody that would not would not be in the door with an IVDR application for a Class D device now wouldn't make it anymore, right? Yeah. So what we actually saw is that that. Uh, especially for class D uh, devices, you could just see that the man class D manufacturers, they, they just basically ignored the whole deadline because I've seen notified bodies actually go on the record on conference uh, saying, hello, IVD people, uh, we notified body, we have capacity for class D devices. Please make applications for class D devices because you know we have spare capacity we can evaluate your device right now. And there was actually, uh, let's say, the reverse scarcity in a class D evaluation slot at note by body, which the bodies, which was not used. So what you see is that this, this moving of deadlines all the time, it creates a kind of a moral hazard almost in the market with manufacturers where they think like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to do this at my own time because they will move the deadlines anyway. And you know why? Because class D IVDs are kind of indispensable, right? They are very necessary. Exactly. So apparently uh, there is this, yeah, I don't know. There is this, the, the, the market is playing chicken with the regulatory system uh, in a way. 
And I've, I'm also seeing that with medical devices under the extension right now, because uh, of course, well, the 20 March last year, the extension was adopted and entered into force. Mm -hmm. So by that time, everybody could know that in every possible scenario with a legacy device, there is one thing that you needed to do in order to uh, benefit from the extension past 26 May 2024, and that is have an MDR that. application and a full quality system uh, application in the works by that date. If you don't, your extension ends right there. What is happening at the moment? There are still manufacturers. I, I see clients actually that, uh, that 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 ask me, yeah, shall I fill in on the form with the notified body that we intend to submit our application on 25 May this year? And then I say like, yes, if you like risk, you should <laughs> totally do that. This is a fantastic idea. What happens if they tell you on 28 May that uh, your application is incomplete and they refuse it? And you didn't make the deadline because it wasn't pending. Oh, oh, does it work like that? Yes, if you would have read the rules, this is how it works. So yeah, what you see is that there's this weird mix between, uh, uh, there seems to be a kind of a sort of almost fatigue to understand yeah. in the market. And, and, and then that is just manufacturers. Then there are all, all the distributors that are getting their change yanked by manufacturers that say, yeah, now we change this, now we change that, now it's like this, now it's like that. And of course, then there is on top of that, there is a sizable amount of uh, countries in the world that rely on uh, a valid CE mark exactly. as a basis for local registration. And like basically a big part of Asia, the whole Middle East, and I would say everywhere in Africa, right? So this is more your specialty than mine, but uh, but basically I think this is this kind of the area where you can make yourself, your life a lot easier for local registration if you have a CE mark. Hey, just a second. Do you need an EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. Yeah, so if, if you if we remember now just uh, about this proposal in March, uh, before the proposal, it was easy. Um, everybody has to move to UMDR by the 26th of May, 2024. No question, mm -hmm. no exception, yeah. no thing, etc. Now, since the proposal, we have those MDCG guidance, flowchart coming, etc. with mm -hmm. Uh, three yep. pages of flowchart. I'm teaching that on my on my courses also. So now I show to them the three pages of flowchart. In that case, you do this. In that case, you do that. In that case, here it is. In that case, that. that. I mean, it's like yes, I said, you have to have a, a degree on the <laughs> on this evaluation to make a, a clear thing that yes, you are able to execute this transition. And mm -hmm. at the end, I call it the extra transition period. So because we had the uh, soft transition period, we ha now we call it the extra soft transition period. So uh, yep. this extra soft transition period, you have it in case you are meeting all those requirements as you are saying. So it makes it complicated. So mm -hmm. for IVDR, are we on the same situation here or it's like a date? Yeah, without basic, basic, basically what we are doing with the IVDR now in the proposal is to, uh, well, it's it also, I mean, you would say if you would amend the IVDR in a way that's consistent with the MDR extension, that would be logical. Yeah. <laughs> it's but not... that's no sports, so they did it differently. So, uh, well, it's a bit, uh, that's that's actually not completely true. Because what they did was they, they did uh, sync it uh, quite a lot. So what they are actually proposing is they are going to move the deadlines uh, for uh, uh, for devices. So class D devices is going from uh, 26 May 2025 to 31 December 2027. Mm -hmm. Class C is going from uh, 26 May 26 to 31 December 2028. Just get my notes here because 
is so complex that even for my big brain, this is sometimes <laughs> getting a bit too complicated. Yeah, class B was was 26 May 2027, and that is going to go to um, 31 December 2029, as well as the class A sterile devices. But then additionally, like they did with the extension, there is also a set of conditions, including the same conditions as we just uh, discussed that the uh, medical devices need to meet by 26 May this year. So quality system, uh, MDR application, same thing, but then, uh, but then for the IVDR, and you need to also uh, put in an application in time. So that means that uh, quality system in time, and then uh, also uh, also you need to make an IVDR application well ahead of time. There's there's this whole ladder of dates which I'm not going to repeat here, but. Yeah. You can reverse engineer it from the proposal, but the logic is more or less the same. But because there are uh, four, uh, sorry, three classes, it's a bit more complicated than under so, the MDR that uses two uh, brackets. So by the 26th of May 2024, MDR and IVDR manufacturer that wants to continue to sell their device as a legacy device have to have an application approved application no, not for IV, not for IVDR that starts at 26 May 2025 ah, for five, quality okay, system okay. so I thought it was yeah. the same, same that's, that's the earliest IVDR date for a quality system okay. so 26 May 2024 is and for then the formal applic and then the formal application so this actually this is a tricky one because this is where there is actually a difference with the MDR because for the IVDR the condition is in Every risk class, you need to have a quality system for IVDR in place by 26 May 2025. So also for class A sterile people, yeah. also for class B in each case. And then the technical documentation, uh, so the formal application for conformity <laughs> assessment, that is staggered. So that's 26 May for 2025 for class D. So you have two and a half years, the notified body has two and a half years, 26 May 2026 for class C, and 26 May 2027 for class uh, B and class A sterile. So, but that means that yeah, although everybody will be like, hey, let's say I have a sterile class A, I will be like, hey, nothing to do until 26 May 2077, no way. Two years ahead of that date, I should have already uh, submitted my quality system. So submitted means what? Means for serving an audit or just submitting an application for it? Now you have to put you have to put it in place. Yeah, you have but to have it in place. Going... Nobody, nobody will check that at, at that moment, I suppose. Well, that's a weird one because if you look in the how to measure that you have put it in place, because that is also the requirement in the MDR. Um, there in the commission guidance uh, about the extension, they said, well, how do we check if you've put your quality system in place? Well, really? because you also need it to do an application for conformity assessment on the same date, right? Because yeah. both the application for the technical documentation and the quality system are on the same date in the MDR, but in the IVDR, they are not. So it's a good question. Uh, how are they going to check whether uh, whether you actually have your quality uh, management system uh, in place. Because I, I had some customer that says that, oh, so it means that by the 26th of September 2024, I need to have an audit before from a notified body or whatever. I say, no, I don't. Well, <laughs> well this is this is actually, this is, uh, this, is, this is one of these things because you have, if you have a legacy device certificate, if you're under surveillance of the notified body, and the validity of the certificate depends on you continued meeting of these requirements. Exactly. So if you are uh, under surveillance of a notified body, yeah, yeah. then yes, you bet that your notified body is going to check if, uh, as part of your PMS, uh, for example, that you uh, that that you've put this system in place. Yeah. 
Exactly. Admittedly, if you do not have a notified body yet, as most of the uh, most of the IVDs will have, yeah, it's still a mystery how they are going to check this. Exactly. So in terms of the shortage now, we talked mainly about uh, uh, Udamed and this mm -hmm. uh, extension for the shortage. The requirements yeah. that you are informing the national authorities and your economic operators that maybe your product will be uh, discontinued or um, stopped, etc. So can you explain more of this principle or, or exactly how yeah. it will be working? Yeah, so this, this clause, um, it consists of a number of uh, uh, important uh, defined terms. So first of all, uh, the the obligation to uh, to inform is triggered by the manufacturer anticipating the manufacturer anticipates an interruption of the supply of a device, other than a custom made device. So the custom made devices are they are of the hook. So that's one. So you need to anticipate. So what when? Can you reasonably anticipate something, right? Is one day before sufficient? <laughs> it's like... Well, no, 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 because you need to anticipate, but, but... Um, let's see. Yeah, so this is this is interesting. Um, you need to provide the information at least six months before the anticipated interruption. So that means that uh, your horizon of anticipation, right? So how far do you need to look ahead? Should be at least six months. I uh, in my in my uh, uh, little micro blog on LinkedIn about this proposal, I said it's a bit about like having to shout tsunami if you see a tsunami coming. So let's say yeah, I'm uh, I'm on the beach, I'm chilling. I have my I have my cocktail. I have my e-reader. I am basking in the sun, and then I see this little wave at the horizon. And then this, let's say, this wave is uh, six months out. Should is that like is that already uh, uh, is yeah? Would that be an anticipated interruption? Because I need to look six months ahead. If I don't look six months ahead, but five months ahead, then I would infringe this provision, competent authority can fine me, right? So, so this is this is already a problem because what is a manufacturer going to do if they think like, shit, my interruption is in four months and I find out only four months ahead. How am I going to make it? So basically, what is he going to do? Is he going to say, well, I think actually the it's an anticipated one. I'm not sure. I think it'll be in six months. So there's a big incentive for the manufacturer to lie. Yeah, or at least find favorable facts. So you could say, oh, actually, this 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 anticipation that, that started happening at four months, actually, uh, well, uh, you know, it's it'll be six months. So there's, there's that. So there's some moral hazard built in there as well. Uh, and this is actually, this is one of the reasons why I already think this, this legislation is not going to function well. I have several cases pending for pharmaceutical clients in the Netherlands against the healthcare inspectorate because we had a similar situation with um, uh, regulation uh, was European regulation that had to be implemented uh, about information for shortages for medicines. And the local reporting criteria were so vague that, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the local wholesalers missed some dates in the eyes of the authorities. So the authorities just fined them and they were serious fines. And the biggest fine issued was 150,000 euros. So this is something that you can't just let slip as a, a, a as a company. So they filed an appeal and an appeal on an appeal. They are litigating about this. Even the competent authority said, yeah, yeah, we agree with you that the criteria were not that clear. You know what? We will give you a reduction of the fine. Will you now revoke the proceedings? No, this is a matter of principle. So we are going to see this exact same problem. So what are all these companies doing now, at least in the Netherlands? 
they are reporting short potential anticipated shortages for everything all the time because then at least you can be sure that you don't get a fine. Is this progress? No, this is not progress. This is garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't help anybody. Could happen here as well. Because again, how are you going to anticipate six months in advance? And what will happen if you anticipate something closer because you just could not anticipate it earlier? I imagine well, also one... that, uh, that, that uh, we have uh, to inform, as I've said, the uh, competent authorities, but we have also to inform the economic operators, but we have an agreement yes. with these economic operators that maybe are not aligned with those regulations. So is this a problem or the law is above well, those agreements? That's, that's, that's more a problem, of course, because uh, with your distributors, and those are the economic operators to which you directly supply devices as a manufacturer, you may, you will probably have a distribution agreement. And in a distribution agreement, you make usually, you make quite detailed agreements about how much the distributor needs to purchase for you, from you every year in order to meet certain targets, in order to keep, for example, an exclusive distributorship. But if you anticipate an interruption of supply, it doesn't mean it will actually happen, eh? because that's the whole part about anticipation. It's something you think will happen, but not something that will necessarily happen. Exactly. So what you get is that if you anticipate an interruption of supply, a distributor may say, hey, but if, there's, if you anticipate not being able to supply me, and you have an obligation to supply me, this is a breach of the agreement, although we are don't know if it will actually happen. So you know what? I hate you already. I want to get rid of this agreement. You know what? I'm going to claim an anticipatory breach of the distribution agreement. Now I will just terminate and run away because now I have an excuse. This is all the kind of shit you are going to see with this kind of proposal if you need to inform the economic operators. The interesting thing is also if you look at I'm always, I'm criticized a lot, uh, Monir, uh, in the medical devices world because I use a lot of parallels between pharmaceutical legislation yeah. because then they say, oh, there's Eric with his pharma legislation again. Of course, I'm not like, let's say, a, 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 a per se pro pharma uh, person, but I mean, pharmaceuticals are also highly regulated health products where they also think about things all the time. So I think it's always good. And these are different people actually that make these rules. So they may come up with different solutions for the same problems, right? And it would be stupid not to look at people that find different solutions for the same problem. So what did they do with uh, medicinal products, for example? There is no obligation to inform all your economic operators. This is not what they are proposing. They are proposing just to notify the competent authorities. Because why would you basically create a lot of drama in your supply chain, right? That's 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 one thing. Uh, also, uh, what they do in uh, what they propose in medicinal products as a change is that they're saying, you know, what there are maybe different reasons for the interruption of supply of devices. Medical devices, typical case in point: you make a formalities mistake and your notified body pulls the certificate. That will lead to an interruption of supply, right? Exactly. But that's different reason, perhaps than, uh, uh, than uh, the um, uh, interruption of supply as a result of a lack of, uh, let's say, raw materials. You might want to treat these situations differently, but no, what does the proposal do? It just says, well, you need, the, the manufacturer needs to, uh, uh, you need to uh, inform of the, uh, of the interruption, You need to have and, uh, every, everything. Everything is following the same route, I suppose. And and only the information provided to the competent authority shall specify the reasons for the interruption. So imagine what happens. You tell your distributor, I anticipate a disruption of supply in six months. You tell the competent authority, 
I anticipate an interruption in supply in six months because my notified body pulled my certificates because we were having an argument about formalities. So what happens then? Distributor is like, what the shit is happening here? Why? Manufacturer, why are you doing this? Well, I'm not telling you because you could use it to terminate the distribution agreement as an anticipate, uh, as a anticipatory breach. Oh, why don't you want to tell me? You tell the authorities. Well, then they might file a freedom of information re uh, uh, re uh, request to the authorities, like, hey, why did this, what did this company tell you? The authorities may actually tell the distributor, because my experience is, is if you file an inf freedom of information request at the authorities, there is really sometimes a stunning amount of confidential information that the authorities are willing to, uh, to tell you. Actually, with the Dutch Health Ministry, I mean, the case where they actually took the absolute crazy, crazy, totally nuts point of view. It's not intended to be disrespectful. It's yeah. just, I think it's crazy. They think it's rational. That Article 109, right, of the MDR, which is about confidential information, mm -hmm. only applies to information that's being uh, in interchanged between competent authorities and doesn't apply to uh, oh. uh, information about the manufacturers. So basically, if you ask the Dutch authorities, everything you tell the Dutch authorities in a vigilance report, even if it's highly company confidential, it is on the street, people. Everybody can, every journalist can just, or every competitor or every claim foundation that wants to file for a product liability claim, they can just go to the Dutch authorities and say, hey, you give me this confidential information because, hey, it only applies between uh, uh, member states anyway. This is nuts. I so, mean, this so, is the biggest so this incentive about being honest on your vigilance uh, reporting. So no need anymore to pay somebody from the company insider to come to tell you anything. You just contact the authority. <laughs> I mean, I was absolutely baffled, baffled. And it is probably somebody in the ministry in the Freedom of Information Department saying this. But the problem is in order to reverse this stupid, 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 not very well thought out point of view, my poor manufacturer client needs to fight this at the ministry, needs to fight it in court, needs to fight it, to fight it in an appeal court before they finally may possibly be right. This is nuts. I mean, why else would we have Article 109 in the MDR? Anyway, I digress back to shortages. Um, yeah. Then, of course, um, there is this other weird point that the manufacturer needs to uh, determine by himself that it's reasonably foreseeable that this interruption may result in serious harm or a risk of serious harm to patients or public health in one of our member states, right? So earlier in this podcast, you said, oh, there must be a list. Exactly. No, <laughs> no list, no. Now, so the manufacturer has to basically say, to what point do I want to self-incriminate myself? Exactly. Because, of course, what you don't want to say is, I mean, this is like anti-marketing, right? <laughs> yeah. like, my product is not oh, so risky. My product is not so important. My product is not so <laughs> good. I mean, yeah, or my product is so important that if I have the bad luck of anticipating a potential uh, uh, interruption in supply, this will seriously disadvantage patients so basically, this will be in the paper. This will be on uh, investigative journalist programs. This will be like, look at these nasty companies that, that cannot even supply products that are essential to healthcare. This will lead to all kinds of possible uh, degrees of, uh, of drama. But also, it may lead to claims uh, because people will say, look, you are suddenly stopping the supply of... Uh, um, because also the legal standard is not, I mean, it's any interruption. Exactly. Because if it would be like a, a voluntary interruption, like we are just going to discontinue this device, that's something else, then I lost my certificate and I can't help it. Right? Or, uh, or my supplier or is even, or even the situation 
which I've also seen where a notified body says, hey, manufacturer, I terminate your certification agreement for convenience. I can do that. You know what the, the, the notice term is that they need to give? Six months. So you get a... so. If, if a notified body doesn't like the color of your logo as a manufacturer, they can say, hey, you know what? We terminate on six months notice. This is allowed. This is what member states allow. Okay. So this means that you get this kind of letter. This is anticipated. Uh, you will never, ever get a new NDR certificate in six months. Not going to happen now. Not possible. So... That means that basically, yeah, you have to send a letter then. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, where are you going to be then? No, if you are only in Europe, then nowhere else. So if you are just closing, I suppose, your business. Uh... No, but, they, but, but really, I mean, this is something you can't help. You have to go on, uh, on the public record uh, that it, it's terrible. It's uh, it's oh. really and and in the end, what you want to do is that what you want is that health institutions and individual healthcare practitioners have enough devices. So that's another point with this proposal that it doesn't take into account cross supplies in the supply chain, for example. And also, how are you going to anticipate? harm to patients in single member state, right? Because as a manufacturer, you may not know how much of your device goes to a specific member state. Mm -hmm. So you don't know how much arrives and you also don't know how much is needed. Because if you are, let's say I am an IVD manufacturer with like, I don't know, 20, 20 staff in California and I sell to an importer in Europe, everything and this importer in Europe sells to a bunch of uh, distributors let's say I don't know 28 eh? or something mm -hmm. like that how on earth am I going to know how much of my device shortage will create a problem in Slovenia exactly oh no I think it's a, it's a valid, valid question and I hope you have people that are yeah, listening uh, are understanding a, a bit of what what this proposal is uh, is providing. Um, Eric, so maybe a last question for for this. So mm -hmm. it's a proposal. It's like uh, oh, I was only getting started because there's more on this proposal. <laughs> oh, <but Okay. laughs> we only have an hour, so uh... exactly. Yeah. So um, so in this proposal, so people can I, I put I will put it anywhere on the show notes. In this proposal, so uh, it's a proposal. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a, an agenda now that it becomes low or it's still like fuzzy? Oh, definitely. Yeah, uh, because uh, actually yesterday the uh, council communicated their common position on this. So the council said, we are fine with this proposal. Okay. And that means that in order for the legislative procedure to, uh, to complete, only the parliament needs to say now that they are okay with this. And then when it is published, uh, in the official journal, it is law. So that could be theoretically in a month or so. Okay. And why does this go so quickly? Well, because um, in May or June, uh, if I remember correctly, we have European elections, the European Commission changes, so there will be this huge European shakeup. And the Commission wants this finished before uh, actually the Commission changes and there might be a new Commissioner with new priorities. Exactly. Right. So this is basically the old Commission putting the crown on its work on uh, managing the complete chaos that the transitional regime uh, became. Uh, last one, maybe. Um... Do you think there will be another proposal after all that, or we have finished? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And uh, why do I think this? Well, when the proposal was made in January, the press release said, oh yeah, by the way, 2024 will also be the year in which we will kick off a, a review of further options. Okay. And uh, as you may know, uh, there is a new part of the MDCG, the Orphan Devices Task Force, yeah. the ODTF, yeah. which is looking at uh, solutions for orphan devices, but also 
uh, uh, niche devices, so devices that are not necessarily orphan, but still special needs, for example, because we don't have any specific procedures for that in, uh, in Europe. And uh, although the MDCG thinks that it is a kind of a leg legislative body, this is still not the way it works. So the MDCG cannot change procedures or put new procedures in place by guidance. So probably the work in the MDCG is going to lead to new proposals specifically for orphan uh, devices procedures. They are currently looking, I know, at how can we uh, fit orphan devices in the current structure so we don't need to change the law, right? So there's, there's uh, work going on on clinical evaluation of orphan devices specifically. But uh, I expect also that this is going to probably be more comprehensive and it's going to lead to specific uh, orphan uh, uh, and other devices in, uh, uh, in uh, the NDR. And there is, uh, of course, with the commission changing um, in the elections, there's also a quite an intense lobby gearing up now to actually uh, yeah, make some more structural changes to the MDR for all the things that, that don't really seem to work that well at the moment. So a lot of like a lot of maybe potential new proposal, new changes, new things. So <laughs> I mean, yeah, I hope we'll have again another discussion with another podcast explaining all that to, to the people. But I hope, yeah, now we have a clear understanding of what is this new proposal about you, you that made uh, IVDR and shortage of devices, um, because I suppose this can impact few some customers, some some manufacturers. But we see also sometimes the nonsense between what is written and what is the reality, as you've said, that you are experiencing with some uh, some of your customers. So I think it's interesting. Yeah, especially when it's about law, don't look too much uh, at consultants. It's so funny. Whenever I'm in discussion with consultants, they always say like, yeah, yeah, well, there's this lawyer again, and you're always on the rules, and... You're always making things overly complicated. Yeah, but rules are my work, right? As a consultant, exactly. you should also be worried about rules rather than about wishful thinking. Exactly. So, um, yeah, and uh, the rules provide the framework within which or provide the operating system on which you have to work. Exactly. I mean, we have to follow the rules, otherwise, yeah, it will be more chaos again. Okay, so thanks, uh, Eric. It was really uh, helpful. And uh, yeah, I put all the, 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 the links on the show notes for people that want to look again at this uh, proposal and all the information. I also put the blog of Eric if uh, you want to check what he has already provided before and uh, his website and profile. So, Eric, thanks very much for all this information. And I wish You're you welcome. Thanks. Sorry for all the excitement. No problem. Bye-bye. <laughs>